My disordered eating cost me a house deposit. If you were to sit down and add up all the money you spent on diets, dieting behaviors, health foods, or attempts to lose weight, how much do you think it would be? The What's Eating You podcast is a series of mental health topics that are designed to make you think, learn, educate, and validate. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to another episode of the What Is Eating You podcast. I'm your resident host and psychologist, Stephanie Giorgio, and I'm so grateful that you are here listening to this episode and being part of the community. Without further ado, let's get straight into it. Today, I'm going to cover a topic not spoken about enough, especially if you don't have an eating disorder or maybe you know someone who might have one. You don't really hear about this too often often. And it is the financial burden of having an eating disorder, disordered eating, or being a slave to diet culture. This episode came about because I put a question on my Instagram stories, which I do every Sunday. It's called Psychology Sunday. So jump on over on Instagram and have your input on what you want to hear on the podcast. And my inbox was flooded with people responding to how much eating disorders or disordered eating financially costed them. Here were some of the responses. Thousands due to seeing nutritionists, naturopaths, psychologists. Someone else said, amazing, this is going to be so good. Another person said, I have to admit, I've spent way too much on quote unquote weight loss. One program cost me $490 US a month. One I'm on at the moment has cost me $2,700 for four months and I've lost one to two kilos, not ideal. Another person said, probably enough for a house deposit, including weight loss surgery, diet programs, products, but it also cost me my youth. And I think that's such a great point. There are so many costs of eating disorders, psychological, financial, emotional, and I go through all of these in my book not to mention the physical costs, but today we're going to focus on the financial cost. Now, the main eating disorders this episode is going to cover include bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and some eating disorders that come under OSFED, which is Other Specified Feeding and Eating Intake Disorder. And what this is, it's basically a category of eating disorders that don't really belong in a particular eating disorder, but the behavior is problematic. So if you're unaware, an eating disorder is a pattern of eating and a preoccupation with your weight, shape, and size that interferes with your ability to live a quote-unquote normal life. It impacts your functioning in some way. Whereas someone on the other end of the spectrum may have disordered eating behaviors, but they're still able to function relatively well. And I guess this is how it starts. So I just want to remind everyone that eating disorders, disordered eating happens on a spectrum, but the level of impairment is basically what defines a diagnosed eating disorder. And we're going to cover a little bit of both. I'm going to also speak about orthorexia, which is a preoccupation with clean or pure eating. It's not a diagnosable condition yet, but it has a lot of emerging research around it. And then just dieting behavior in general. So what are the top six financial costs of eating disorders, disordered eating, and everything? Now, these are also backed up by statistics. One, purchasing binge foods. What does this mean? So basically when you have bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, you engage in binge eating. Binge eating means you're eating a large amount of food in a short period of time and there is a sense of loss of control. Following a binge, there are feelings of shame, guilt, remorse, anxiety, lots of different emotions. You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, but I binge eat all the time. The difference between overeating, which everyone does, you overeat on Christmas, on Easter, your belly feels pretty full is the frequency it happens, how long it happens for, and the level of distress. 
right? You can overeat and think, oh gosh, I overate, I'm really full, take a nap. And then you don't really think much about it. But binge eating, it feels compulsive. It feels out of control and you constantly think about it. People may go out of their way to plan binges. And this is where purchasing binge foods comes into play. People spend hours thinking about what they're going to buy, right? And research has shown that it's actually thinking about the activity that boosts your dopamine more than the activity itself. So they've done research where they've found people who think about drinking a milkshake have high levels of dopamine compared to when they actually drink the milkshake. So this is why a lot of people are attracted to the idea of eating certain foods or buying certain foods because the thought does produce dopamine. But then they say, oh, I know it's going to make me sick or why didn't I think of this before I ate it? It's because the thought is exciting more than the behavior itself. So they may fantasize about buying McDonald's or going to Baker's Delight and binge eating episodes are large amounts of food. I'm talking blocks of chocolate. I'm talking bowls of cereal. I'm talking loaves of bread. And I go through detail in my book with what I actually ate during a binge. And it's confronting. My book's called Food Jail, Breaking the Bars of Binge Eating. Now, according to a study published in the International Journal of Eating Disorders, individuals with binge eating disorder had significantly higher monthly grocery bills, spending on average $131 more compared to those without the disorder. The relentless struggle can lead to financial strain, it can lead to financial insecurity and debt. The amount of people I have met who are in debt because of eating habits is astounding. I'm talking they are in debt because they're using credit card to buy food, they're in debt to afterpay companies. Did you know you can afterpay food? I mean, all this technology, it's meant to be more effective and more efficient, but is it actually causing people to get more and more in debt? The next financial cost of an eating disorder or disordered eating or diet culture is laxatives and purging. So misuse of laxatives is a common method employed by those with eating disorders to compensate for binge eating or control weight. I will highlight binge eating disorder and bulimia are different. They both have binge eating, but the difference is people with bulimia compensate. So they get rid of the food, either using laxatives or self-induced vomiting. Whereas binge eating disorder, there's no compensatory behavior. So apart from buying laxatives, according to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, individuals with bulimia may spend up to $300 per month on laxatives a substantial expense that exacerbates the financial strain caused by the disorder. And that's one method. I'm not even talking about teas that make you go to the toilet. I'm not even talking about other ways of of compensating, exercise, purging, etc. Now, on the train of bulimia nervosa brings me to the third type of financial cost associated with eating disorders. And there's many, but I decide to summarize it to six. It is dental expenses. I've had people who have spent $40,000 having to get new teeth because what happens is purging through vomiting wreaks havoc on your oral health and it leads to dental issues such as enamel erosion, chipped teeth. The, The acid from the vomit rots your teeth. I probably should have put a trigger warning in this episode, so I apologize if this is confronting. The Academy for Eating Disorders reports that individuals with bulimia nervosa may spend on average $4,000 per year on dental treatments, including fillings, root canals, and tooth extractions. And it's very common more than you think. And what I find super interesting is dentists don't ask about this. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. If you're a dentist listening to this or if you've had to have teeth work done because of an eating disorder, does your dentist know? I'm curious to know. 
Because my fear when I used to go to the dentist was, oh my gosh, are they going to know? Can they tell if you've been self-vomiting? Can they tell if you have an eating disorder? Anywhere I used to go, doctors, you just have this fear that everyone can see it written on your forehead that you have an eating disorder. So the dental expense is a big one. Number four, the debt from ordering through a food app. Okay. In our digital age, food delivery services such as Uber Eats, DoorDash, Menulog, and all the ones in the other states and countries have unparalleled convenience. However, they are also creating massive problems. It makes individuals with eating disorders use these apps because it's secretive. There's no shame. And research shows when people order through an app or even through the little kiosk, you know, when you go to McDonald's and you can order from the the window inside, it's not a window, it's a computer and you can customize your order. Research has shown that people are more likely to include sides or that extra ration of bacon than they are with an actual person serving them. So this is why a lot of businesses are now bringing in scanning the code on the table or they're bringing in ordering from the computer because people are more likely to be upsold. People are more likely to order that extra treat because you're not being judged by a waitress or you don't think you're being judged by a waitress. Now, I've had people spend up to $700 a week on food ordering services. And that's for a mixture of different reasons, convenience, but there's more subconscious reasons they don't realize. Many people use food ordering apps to regulate their emotions. They feel stressed and scrolling through the food options gives them a sense of dopamine. Many people will scroll through menus and sometimes with no intention of even buying because it's meeting that need and that excitement. Many people with eating disorders scroll through social media food pages to meet that need of vicariously eating without actually eating the food. Now, the ordering through apps, it can become a crutch for people with eating disorders that intensifies their struggles. According to a survey, 36% of respondents with eating disorders reported accumulating debt from ordering food online. The ease of accessing an abundance of food options coupled with emotional triggers can result in impulsive purchases and mounting credit card bills. I remember a girl I knew was telling me about Milk Run. If you haven't heard of Milk Run, it's groceries in under 10 minutes. And she said, it is the ultimate. She said, I can have a binge and get it over and done with and have things to my door in 10 minutes. So she struggled with binge eating and bulimia, I believe. And this was a perfect opportunity. I know within 10 minutes, I'm going to get the binge food. I don't need to talk to anyone. I don't need to see anyone. And it's easy. So just think about this and think about how much it costs. And then, of course, platforms like Uber Eats, they reward you. You end up getting on a point system or you get on this type of train where the more you order, the more you save. And it's addictive. I've had people go to the extremes of contacting their bank saying, please block Uber Eats. They've tried to delete the app. They've tried to get it blocked and it's impossible. You can't. So as much as people want to, they delete the app, they reinstall it. They delete the app, they reinstall it. It is an addiction. The fifth type of financial strain on an eating disorder is the professional help. Now, seeking help is essential for recovery from an eating disorder. However, the cost of treatment can present as a significant barrier. There are so many people who don't get help because one, they think it's normalized and they think, well, I just need to lose weight and then my disorder will be fixed. A study published in the International Journal of Eating Disorders revealed that individuals with eating disorders incurred healthcare costs that were 36% higher than those without the disorder. When we think about expenses of professional help, we see therapy sessions, consultations with psychiatrists, specialized 
treatment programs. And you've got, I guess, the therapy side, but then you've got the huge weight loss programs. And if you go back to the episode with Bethany Gettis, she talks about how there was, I guess, a luxury item that people would buy. And she worked in this weight loss clinic. People pay so much for weight loss medications, for diet pills, for therapy, and it doesn't just stop there. Again, it leads to even more care needed. What is positive is now on a mental health plan, you do get 40 sessions that are rebated partially by Medicare, depending on who you see. So that is a a bonus. Now the final sixth financial burden which I really wanted to include because I feel this is very normalized, is the purchasing of healthy foods or quote unquote diet foods. I was a victim of this and we're more likely to see this in orthorexia. Now, it's not a diagnosable condition, but it's an unhealthy obsession with eating only pure or clean foods. So these are your types of influences and they're everywhere, not to call anyone out, but A lot of orthorexic people existed in the internet promoting super clean eating, gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free. Remember that era? I was part of it. I used to post recipes that were free of anything but taste, right? Sweet potato brownies. And I actually really like them. There's nothing wrong with this way of eating, but I feel it did become a cult at a specific point in time. And if you couldn't get gluten-free, you'd freak out. Now, people with orthorexia, which is, you know, eating clean, eating pure, not having preservatives, it's more than eating for weight or weight loss. It's more about purity. They spend excessive amounts of time and money on foods that are perceived as healthy. So the relentless pursuit of the perfect diet can be a financial burden. It can be very expensive. I remember loaves of bread being $12, certain supplements being a lot, greens powders. And look, some of these things are necessary and important, but it's when you don't need it. If you're not a diagnosed celiac or you don't have to have dairy-free to the point it's affecting you. I know people who've driven an hour, two hours just to find a restaurant that was potentially dietarily friendly because the anxiety of eating in a restaurant that wasn't quote unquote clean was too much to bear. So specialized food products such as gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free alternatives, they're more expensive because there's additional processing and ingredients involved. A survey conducted by Gluten-Free and More magazine found that individuals following a gluten-free diet spent approximately 242 more percent on groceries compared to those without dietary restrictions. This expense can add up quickly, further straining the financial circumstance of people who are trying to eat super clean or super healthy. According to a study published in the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition, adhering to an organic diet can cost an average of 25% more than a non-organic diet, potentially stretching the budgets of those with the preoccupation of eating clean or healthy. So if this is you, you really need to ask yourself, is purchasing all these foods really necessary? And again, supplements, right? In the quest of optimal health and nutrition, superfoods, vitamins, minerals, they can be costly. I know. I just ordered magnesium, $56 for a tub. That's like an added luxury expense, right? But that's one thing. I remember I used to train at a gym and they get you onto all these amazing supplements. And I get it. They can serve a purpose and a function. But then there's that other side where, People are really convinced they need these and it adds up. It's so expensive. The Nutritional Business Journal estimates that the global market for dietary supplements reached $133 billion in 2020. 
People are investing so much money in pursuit of the perfect nutritional profile. And I'm just covering food. I'm not even talking about protein powders, gym memberships, Pilates, all of that. And yes, remember, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get this, but I'm saying if you're struggling with an eating disorder, it can be extreme to the point that it's detrimental. As you can see, no matter where you sit on this spectrum, you may be impacted by these financial strains. If you want to know how to manage this or where to start, let me know and I'll do a part two. Because you may not even be aware that these costs are affecting you. One quick tip I would suggest is starting to track your expenses when it comes to this area of your life. We know awareness precedes change. And once you're aware of how much food, dental, eating disorder behavior is costing you, you can start to formulate a plan for change. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode and it's been educational and validating. Thank you for joining me. Remember, if you enjoy the episode, please let me know. Leave a rating. We just hit 30 on Spotify. Thank you so much. Or a review on Apple. And remember, confronting the challenges of mental health, it takes courage and it takes compassion. If you found this episode insightful, please share it with others to spread the awareness. And remember, you are not alone in the struggle. If you want to grab a copy of my book, it's available on Audible on a free trial. Get it for free. Or if you want a physical copy that I sign, you can grab it in the links in my socials and use the discount code MINDFOOD20. Thanks again, and I'll see you for another episode soon. 